talk about advanced API design, how an awesome API can attract friends, make you rich, and change the world. So depending on who you are, you might be thinking this sounds kind of interesting, APIs are interesting. Others of you might be thinking this sounds absolutely boring. What could be more boring than an API? So if you're in the latter camp, I apologize in advance for the next 40 minutes. Uh, but I, I do want to try to convince you that APIs are interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm only going to spend a couple minutes today on the basics of like what an API is and how they work and all that. And then I kind of want to get into some more interesting things. Uh, so uh, let's try to do this in like two minutes. I have a timer right here, so I'll tell you how to do. Uh, so an API is an application programming interface. Uh, it's a way for two applications to talk to each other, two bits of software to talk to each other. Uh, kind of like a user interface where a user talks to software, an API is a way for software to talk to software. So the first interesting thing is that they're both interfaces. Uh, there's a couple kinds of APIs. Uh, you, can call you can call a library or an SDK an API. It's, it's kind of like a local API. It's like an API within a specific system of software, maybe within the same memory space between two bits of code. So NetSAH and Ruby is like an API to Ruby functionality. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not this kind of API, it's web service APIs. A web service API is a way for two kind of external systems to talk to each other. You can think of it like a, a universal API. You don't have to be running the same language or the same operating system or uh, you know, be located in the same uh, server or, or facility or anything. Uh, web services, uh, early web services were done with uh, the simple object access protocol, SOAP, which was named simple, I think with a straight face, which is interesting. Um, uh, uh, SOAP has given way recently to REST as an API structure. I'm not going to talk too much about SOAP. Uh, REST is a great way to run an API, and it's basically how almost every API is written today. REST is just the realization that HTTP is an API protocol. In fact, the web is an API. It's an API between two bits of software, your web browser and a website. So your web browser makes an API request like, get records, I want to read information. Or like, post a record, I want to write information. Uh, so finally, when you're doing an API, you need some way, uh, some like data structure to uh, send information back and forth. Uh, typically, that is either XML or JSON. XML is kind of entrenched uh, uh, in a lot of places. JSON is basically does the same thing in a much more elegant way. Um, but you may have to worry about both. So actually, it's exactly two minutes. So I, I, I did okay at that time. The practice was a little long. So there's the two minute intro to APIs. Um, let's talk about things that are a little more interesting now. Uh, and I want to do this. I want to start autobiographically and talk about my experience uh, with APIs, and then get into um, uh, some other things. Uh, so uh, I'm a co-founder of a startup called ZenCoder. Uh, we are basically an API to a high-performance video encoding farm in the cloud. Um, so our whole product is an API. We don't really have a product. We just have an API. Um, uh, we have a user interface, um, uh, but our user interface is not that interesting. You wouldn't, you wouldn't like pay us money for access to our user interface. Uh, similarly, we have stuff going on in the background uh, 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 but that's a black box. You, you don't know how we do what we do. All you know is whether or not we respond properly to API requests. Um, has anyone here tried ZenCoder before? Uh, so as far as, as far as you guys know, uh, uh, we just like have a guy back at the office like downloading files when they come in and like encoding them with handbrake, right? Uh, but you don't really care as long as we meet the obligations of our API. Uh, we, we don't do um, actually, but uh, we could if we had enough people. Um, so let's let's kind of look at some categories of APIs. Is, is this cutting out? Like, yes. can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's try the other mic. Let's try the other mic. Uh, how is this better? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. All right. Um, so. Uh, Let's look at some different categories of APIs uh, that you might see. Uh, the first category is what I want to call like secondary APIs. These are things where the application works without the API. The API just sort of extends the functionality of the application. So you can use Flickr on its own, right? You probably you, that's how most of us probably use it. But it's interesting in an interesting move. Flickr kind of opened up all that functionality to uh, be an API, which lets you do more and more powerful things with it. So you can use Flickr without it, but the API just sort of extends the functionality. 
Uh, the second group of APIs uh, that uh, uh, came along recently is uh, infrastructure as an API. This is where I think things get really interesting. So Amazon Web Service is, is like an API to Linux, or an API to file storage, or an API to uh, uh, you know, message queuing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, that's, that, that's pretty cool. Um, the next group is uh, uh, really sort of a recent trend in uh, software today. And that's, a, that's APIs to specific technology. So things that you could do without an API, you could buy a box, you could buy a server, you could buy some software to get all this functionality. We could all do it ourselves, but it would probably take us you know, a few months or whatever. We'd have to maintain it, uh, have some capital expenditure. Uh, so Twilio is an API to telephony. You can, with Twilio, get like pay-as-you-go like, telephone lines. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can do that on your own with Asterisk or with like a big PDX box or whatever. Uh, but the fact that it's delivered via an API is powerful. Uh, the last group of APIs is, uh, uh, I, I didn't know what it's called, so I called them like sci-fi APIs. These, these are things that are kind of crazy. Um, has anybody, anybody used PyCloud? PyCloud is like a, an API, or it, it, it's like Python processing in the cloud. You like include PyCloud in your Python application and like execute it, and Python is actually executed in the cloud. So if you have some massively parallelizable problem, you can like write your code locally, run it locally, and it actually gets run in, in the cloud, which is cool. Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk and Crowdflower are an API to people, uh, which really sounds like, that sounds like a Philip Tate Kidding story or something, right? So, um, so uh, uh, that, that, that's kind of where APIs are right now, uh, some, some categories of APIs that are uh, uh, kind of emerging. Um, uh, where I want to spend most of my time in the talk today is talking about how to make an API that's good. Um, we spend a lot of time on our API Accenture design of it and how we, how we do it. Uh, and we get people you know, praising uh, our API, people who like our API. Uh, but I, I don't want to shill Zencoder too much in this talk, so I'm actually going to uh, uh, redact uh, Zencoder uh, uh, whenever I use it. So, uh, there you go. Uh, so here, here, here's some things we're doing. <laughs> Hacking up integration with Redacted and Recurly. I really love good APIs. They make my life as a developer suck so much less. Does anyone, did anyone resonate with that sentiment? Uh, bad APIs are absolutely painful and horrible to work with. Uh, the whole point of an API is to give you some functionality uh, uh, in, in an easy, quick way. Um, so it's important to, you, uh, to, to design these things well. But how do you design a good API? Uh, uh, who, who, who else has worked on an API before? Good, that's like a third of the room, that's cool. Uh, probably a large part of the rest of you will at some point in the next few years. Uh, so we're going to look at like 10, I don't know, 10, 12 tips uh, from our experience of, of, of how, to, how to build a good API. We actually don't do all these, but they're what we should be doing. Um, uh, and then you know, maybe we can talk if you guys have ideas that, uh, of other things that contribute to good API design. Uh, so first, you should version your API. Um, and if you version your API, you should do it early in the life of the API. It's kind of hard to retroactively add a version, depending on how you do it. Um, the reason you want to version an API is this. Let's say you have an API that lets you read a record. So this record, the color is green, the velocity is green. Uh, what if you want to change that instead of returning green as a string to returning green as a hex value? You want to do that instead. Well, what's going to happen is that everyone who's depending on your code to behave in that way, their applications are going to start breaking. They're going to get unexpected behavior because they thought green was a string instead of a hex value. So what you do is you version your API. You put uh, uh, there's a number of ways you can do this, this is just one example. API slash v1, and then the action. Uh, uh, and then if you request this action with this, you get the string read. If you request v2, you get the hex value. Uh, a side note here is you shouldn't do this too often. You shouldn't like have version after version. Whenever possible, you should, you should try to avoid breaking anything uh, backward compatibility. It's, it's kind of a pain to manage multiple versions, both for the users of the API and uh, second, you should follow REST conventions. Uh, REST is basically the way, again, basically the way every API is written these days. I'm sure there's exceptions, but um, it, 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 it's, it's a great, simple API language. Everyone's using it, and everyone's using it already uh, on the web, even if they're not building APIs. Um, uh, has anyone here built a Rails app before? <laughs> um, if you have, you have built a REST API. So there you go. Uh, the, the Rails controller structure doesn't even have to really change for you to actually make like an API specific app. Exactly what happens by default uh, uh, in a Rails controller, uh, almost exactly is what you need with an API. 
So that means combining nouns and or verbs and objects. Uh, uh, whenever you do an action, you end up having a verb, something that's done, and something that's done to. Uh, and that, 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 that's why REST is sort of an elegant way to, uh, to define the API. It's, it's kind of the way we think, right? You, uh, you read information, you write information, or you delete information. Uh, and that information uh, or, or uh, functionality can be you know, a record or a job or a message or, or whatever your application is concerned with. Uh, next, use good HTTP codes. Um, here's some of the codes that we use in uh, Zencoder. Um, you've probably seen 200 and 404 before. Um, uh, but there's actually a, a, a lot of different uh, HTTP response codes. Um, uh, actually, we, we don't use 418 on the teapot. Um, uh, we'd like to at some point. So, um, so if the user's posting data, if they're creating records, you could respond with a 200 bouquet. As in, we acknowledge your request successfully, uh, but you give you give the user more information if you respond with a two or one created. You actually tell them that something was created. Um, uh, four hundreds are uh, 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 client errors, five hundreds are server errors. You guys all know this. Uh, we use a four hundred bad request for like a malformed request, like invalid JSON. Uh, we call it a four hundred. Uh, four hundred one unauthorized is obvious. Someone tries to do something that you don't have permission to do. Uh, payment required. We don't use that now. But we at some point, uh, if someone tries to do something they don't have, you know, they're not set up to properly pay for that if it's a paid action. Um, uh, 422 unprocessable for, for something that, that doesn't validate me. Um, so you've seen a lot of these in Rails, but there, there's, there's many more uh, response codes, and you might have other ones that are more applicable to your application. Uh, next, um, use smart validations. Um, uh, Let's say someone posts this data to your application. API key of not a real key. And assume for the sake of argument that that's not a real key. Uh, how should you respond? <coughs> you can do like a 500 server error. It's the wrong key, so you blow up. Um, uh, but that's the wrong code, because that says that it's your fault on the server side, not their fault. So it's better than that, you can do a 401 than authorize. Uh, but you can actually go a step further than that. You can actually give them some information, because that might mean that they tried to access with a valid API key, a resource that they don't have uh, permission to. So you can send it back errors. Um, anyone ever seen an array of error strings before? This is exactly what you do uh, uh, with a web form in Rails. You do the exact same thing in an API. Um, you can actually go further than this, not just say that the uh, API key is not found. We can validate the structure of the API key and say that it may not be in spaces. Uh, and we can go one step further and not just say that it's not found, but tell them how to find it. Please log in to example.com slash account slash API to retrieve your API key. <coughs> Guarantee you a user seeing this message when they're struggling to integrate with your app is going to be very glad that you put it there. Uh, another example, uh, what's wrong with this JSON here? Uh, has it, 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 that, that's something that I've probably done you know, 30 times in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, so when this happens, you can return a 400 bad request. Uh, but why not actually bake a JSON parser into your API and return what's wrong with the request? So errors, JSON is not valid and provide the syntax error. There's libraries that do this uh, that you can uh, get on GitHub. Uh, next, um, if you want to support everyone, consider supporting both JSON and XML. Uh, reason being that this guy with the servers and the nice shirt probably doesn't know what JSON is. Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe thinks it's like a security error. Um, uh, whereas this guy is not going to use XML on press. <laughs> <laughs> the, the good news is that it's really easy to support both. You can more or less translate between JSON and XML back and forth. Um, uh, and Rails also helps you. So if you submit a request uh, and you specify content type of application JSON or content type of application XML, Rails will actually automatically parse that JSON or XML into a parameter hash, um, uh, just like you're posting a web form. Uh, also, uh, I'm a little slow on the Rails 3 update. So this is Rails 2.3, and I apologize for that. Is, is, it, is it different in Rails 3? Uh, so, so this next one, I think, is different. Uh, same principle applies. Um, so Rails will automatically handle that inbound, and it obviously also handles it uh, on the response side too. This is different Rails, right? You can still do that. Yeah, There's just a better way, maybe. So, so 
So it's, it's, it's not that hard. The biggest problem is that arrays are kind of hard, harder to define in XML than in uh, JSON. It's a little less elegant than Rails.2XML, uh, uh, or just work. Dot two xml doesn't do it uh, necessarily the way you want it to work. Anyway, uh, next, you should document your uh, API. Uh, integrating with an API that is not documented, <coughs> or worse, is like incorrectly documented, is basically impossible. So put a lot of time into this. This is not the most fun part of the project, um, but it's really important and it's also something that users really appreciate as well. Um, so we, we actually, to do this, we actually wrote a DSL for our documentation. <laughs> um, and we also did part of this because we have a lot of settings in our API. We have um, like 100 settings, or I don't know how many settings in our API. Uh, uh, but, but we wrote this little DSL where you can take a setting. So this is the audio channel setting. You can specify how many audio channels you want when you encode a video. Uh, we can build a short description, a long description, examples, uh, you know, valid uh, data types, et cetera. Uh, and then we can uh, convert that into sort of like nice dynamic documentation. So you can see uh, all this information, uh, actually see like a JSON example of what it looks like to use this example, or the setting in an API request. See an XML, that says XML right there. I don't think you can see that. Um, uh, switch to XML, et cetera. Um, this is, we're like open sourcing this to, uh, so it's, it's a little raw, but um, I, I, I think it's something that could be um, useful in other places, so. Uh, next, um, real simple one, uh, uh, even if you have a really easy, nicely designed API, uh, it's nice to have like libraries for it, have like a Ruby wrapper around your API, have a Python PHP wrapper, et cetera. Um, definitely have a raw API as well, uh, uh, so that you know, user, you know, closure users, whoever can Um, support your API, especially especially if it's like uh, a major part of what you're doing, if it's like how you're making your life. Because at the end of the end of the day, APIs are kind of scary. Uh, an API is basically a black box to something that's probably critical to you, and you have no way of troubleshooting or debugging or figuring out what's wrong if the API doesn't work. Um, and if it's unsupported, that's kind of a dangerous place to be. Uh, and if it, if it is supported, again, it's a, it goes a long way towards towards. Uh, Making API is awesome. Uh, I'm gonna go quick on a couple of these just uh, in the interest of time, but uh, uh, make your API fast. Um, API requests don't necessarily have to have all of the overhead that a normal web request has. Uh, so consider you know using a different uh, uh, using middleware for your APIs or, or maybe maybe something different on the back end. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's much easier to write code that like it's an API like thousand times a second, then for a user to click a browser, you know, like reload a thousand times a second. Uh, so you will get more people uh, 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 accidentally uh, uh, killing your API. So making it fast helps there. The other thing that helps is rate limiting. You might want to consider um, uh, not letting a user make more than a certain number of requests per second. Uh, at least for things that are not, uh, you know, that you don't need like percent uh, data. Um, couple more. Um, Consider logging API requests. So every time a request comes in, write it to some sort of data storage, temporary or permanent. Um, so uh, uh, you could like, and, and, and then take that and actually display it to the user. So the user can like log in and take a look at all of the API requests that they've made. This is really useful when they are trying to get set up with an API and trying to figure out maybe why something didn't work. Um, uh, give them the ability to dig in and see what they sent to you, what you responded with, and if it's a problem, what's wrong with it. Uh, last thing, uh, um, even though the API is ultimately for uh, uh, you know uh, software to use and not for users to use, you can build all sorts of great tools around an API to make it easier for users to understand the API and to get set up with the API. Um, we have this little thing called an API request builder um, uh, that we built. It's simple. It, it, it's, it, it's not it's not it's not a huge piece of software, <coughs> but it basically lets a user kind of interact with their API uh, and get an example of what the JSON that they need to post to us is. Um, so you can choose your settings and, and basically copy and paste that right there, and that's a valid API request. And then uh, when this is submitted, um, you'll see the response that we give you back. So you can basically build your application, uh, at least start, start building your application on this. So, uh, what else? What are some other uh, ideas for, for uh, uh, 
what makes a good API. Is there authentication mechanisms? So different authentication mechanisms. Great, different authentication, such as? Uh, basic authentication over HTTPS. Yep. Still works. Yep, yep. Um, the ability to generate new access keys. New, sorry. Access keys? Well, the ability to generate new access keys, yeah, definitely, yep. Another simple web tool you can make, an easy you know, way for someone to, uh, to change that if their key is compromised or lost or whatever. Good names. Just like, if you see it, you, go, you immediately know what that is. Yep, good naming of, of the fields in the API, uh, uh, even, even the, maybe the controllers and actions in the API as well. Yeah, it's just like variables. You know, we're Ruby programmers. We, we, we don't call our variables like S or like, you know, I, I, yeah. we, we, we name our variables things that you can read and you know what it is. Same thing applies here. Client library wrappers around your APIs. Yeah, client, client library wrappers around your APIs. Yep. Consistent responses. <clears throat> Consistent responses. Consistency in general. Um, uh, it, it, well, what sort of consistency? Uh, Simil in, in similar methods behave similarly. <laughs> Say S similar methods should behave in the same fashion. Sure, yep. Similar methods should behave similarly. Some sort of test framework, sandbox environment, or even a unit test kind of gen library would be great. Yeah, that's great. A, a sand, uh, API sandbox. People should be able to do anything with an API <coughs> uh, without ki killing your system. Good examples. Good examples. Yep. yep. Uh, guessable URLs. Guessable URLs. In in in, in what sense? In, in what way? Um, that if, if there are products, there should probably be a product URL. I could, you know, I don't have to read some documentation to figure that out. Sure. Yep. yep. Or if like you know, fr uh, a person slash ID slash friends. You know, I should be able to just like, you know, figure it out without reading the documentation. One, one thing I think is really cool about uh, uh, is uh, uh, with, the t with the Twitter search API, I don't know if it's still this way, I know they changed it. You can like go to search.twitter.com and search, and the same thing you search for there is what you get when you uh, pull the Twitter search API. That's kind of cool, right? It's, it, 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 it's uh, uh, like a way of interacting with the API without uh, actually using the API. Is there flexible uh, building, reporting, and security structures? Flexible building, reporting, and security? Consuming your own API, being your own API customer, definitely. Right. Yeah. Why? Why search that? Yeah. Well, same, same thing. Consuming its status, where people know if it's up or down, would be very useful. Yeah. Good status, absolutely. What and, and, and not just status of uh, whether it's working or not, but issues are uh, exist around the API. When an API breaks, you know, conceivably thousands of other applications break at the same time. So those kind of things are really, really important. Cacheability. Cacheability of uh, your, your responses should, amongst other things, like e-tags, if you can manage them, uh, how long they live, that kind of thing, so that as a consumer I can tell whether I need to request. Yeah, that's great. So using e-tags and time to lose all, uh, all that on the uh, uh, data being sent back. Uh, data integrity. <laughs> data integrity? Yeah. Well, I say, say more. Like, uh, you want your data to be there. You don't just want your data to just go away. <laughs> You're running Are you thinking of like uh, Flickr losing like, a user's account? <laughs> yeah, just in general, like bad things. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I don't want it to do. You have an API. Yeah. Single responsibility? Say more. Yeah, that's good, that's good. So some level of like atomicity, like your API requests. You should let people be able to like chain API requests or, or, or choose just one little piece and, and combine them in the way that they want to combine them, as opposed to you, you forcing you know, everything into a single structure. Interesting. 
so the ability to combine multiple requests in a way that the server will understand that it's actually multiple, take one request and do five actions. Yep, good. Support for my IRC channel. Uh, we use Campfire, it's the same as IRC, but kind of on the web, which is really convenient for users. Um, uh, but if you're doing a hacker project, IRC, absolutely. Um, support form, especially if you want users to support each other. Cool. Um, well, uh, uh, what's the end result of this? What happens if you create an awesome API? I kind of alluded to three things in the um, title of my talk. Uh, right. VC funding. You get VC funding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, three things. Uh, you can make friends, um, uh, get rich, uh, maybe with or without VC. Although VC funding doesn't make you rich. That, that does, uh, uh, makes them rich if, if you succeed. Uh, or uh, and third, uh, change the world. So, Let's talk about this a little. Uh, an awesome API can help you make friends. Uh, here's a tweet um, we saw a little while ago. Uh, <laughs> Redacted is so awesome that I'd like to offer their developers free hugs. Um, that's, that's like an offer for free hugs from a total stranger. Um, uh, that's interesting. Uh, and I think there's a reason for this, a reason why this happened. I said awesomeness gets noted, no, noticed in some places more than others. Um, there's probably some like, you know, econ uh, uh, economics term for this, or like psych, you know, psychology term for this. I'm going to call it an asymmetrical reward curve because it sounds kind of fancy and I think it expre uh, expresses this. Um, uh, some things in life, as quality goes up, the value goes up eh, linearly, let's say. Uh, there's other things where as quality goes up, the, the value doesn't go up quite as fast. Like, there's less I don't know, marginal value as, as, as quality increases. Uh, there's other things that follow the opposite pattern. Uh, when you start to get better and better, uh, uh, it's more and more value. Uh, let's look at an example, uh, bus driving. Um, the best possible bus driver, how much better is the best possible bus driver than like the immediate bus driver? And I'm just talking about only with respect to driving buses, not like a bus driver who fights crime or something. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how much better is that? Not, not that much better, right? Uh, conversely, the worst, the, the uh, worst possible bus driver uh, is a pretty big, uh, pretty big concern. <laughs> Uh, looking, looking at the uh, the opposite, um, I think sports is a great example of the opposite curve. Uh, the best possible basketball player is not like 10% better than the guy at the Y. Uh, uh, they're compensated accordingly. Uh, same is true in art, in, in music, in, in, uh, in entertainment. And, and I think uh, API design follows this uh, this sort of same pattern. And actually, I think a lot of developer things do. Uh, but let's stick with API design. Uh, as, as, as you like increase the quality of your API, it gets more and more noticed and valued and appreciated. Um, uh, one, one, one more email, uh, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this, this is an email uh, uh, we got. Um, uh, redacted, uh, blah, blah, blah. Redacted seriously uplifted my entire day. Uh, API is well designed, etc. So when I started digging in, I, I felt like I was witnessing a double rainbow. Uh, then when I found the API builder, um, it went beyond a double rainbow to a level that I can only imagine is equal to witnessing a unicorn birth. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs>
uh, uh, PyCloud is early on, and you'll probably find some amazing things that PyCloud hasn't thought of. You know, do they, whether they're specific for Ruby or not. This, this is sort of new unexplored territory. Uh, two other ideas that I think are kind of cool um, uh, that uh, I'll probably never build, um, but uh, what about an API to the government? Uh, does anyone like, like filling out forms and like the DMV? Sunlight Labs. Sun Sunlight Labs. Yeah, Sunlight Labs. What, what, do, do they actually do this? Do they actually provide uh, interactive access to? They have, they have a product which is a data catalog of other APIs that exist in various governmental organizations that are by this federal, state, local Yep. Yep. So, so, so provide, I mean, the, the, pr provide this enormous functionality in a simple, convenient way. People are going to be able to do amazing things with that. Uh, or what about API to manufacturers? So Amazon EC2 is like a server farm in the, uh, in the cloud. What if you had like a farm of 3D printers? And people can make API requests to you and say, I would like a thousand and like oh, whatever, and you give them a spec. And they go beyond there and do like, you know, plastic molding and laser cutting and all that. That'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. So uh, finally, um, APIs uh, uh, can, allow, can allow you to change the world. Um, back in like 1999 or 2000, there was a bubble in technology, uh, and companies were raising you know, 10 million dollars without having uh, revenue or, or a product or an idea. Um, <laughs> and most of this was hype, um, but there was one kind of reason. So that's that it was expensive to start a technology company in 1999. You had to pay a lot of money to Larry Ellison, and you had to like buy, you had to buy like your web server from Netscape, and you had to like buy your operating system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened? Open source. <laughs> Richard Stallman happened. Uh, uh, and today, you can you can you can acquire better technology that was available 10 years ago for zero dollars. That's really powerful. Uh, what that does is uh, allow, um, it, it allows us, uh, uh, pre previously we, the, the hackers, were like beholden to the Harvard MBA students. They would get rich or become VCs or whatever, uh, and we'd have to go ask them for money in order to do things. And that's not true, and that's really powerful. Now we ask for $20,000 from Paul Graham, uh, or we don't ask for anything, and we bootstrap, and we end up in some business magazine, like uh, 37 Signals. Uh, that's that, that's really cool. It's it's uh, it, it's how uh, uh, um, Facebook and Justin Timberlake were able to. Uh, to <laughs> <laughs> so I think open source is the technology uh, revolution of the 2000s. It absolutely changed the game. And I think Jeff Bezos and Amazon is running the technology revolution of the next decade of, the, of this decade. Uh, and it's going to be another major step forward in productivity. Where small small teams can. Awesome things that they couldn't do before. Thanks. Time for questions or thoughts or anything. This isn't a question, but redacted uh, your API builder, like the sample request and text, like is amazing. Everyone who builds an API should just do that. Because I mean, like I, I had your API up and running in like 10 minutes. It was so awesome. Thanks, thanks, appreciate it. That, and, and what we did there is equally applicable to you, honestly, to any API that that where we have to pass data in. Some APIs are more read-only and you're just like getting data. But if you're passing a lot of variables, that, that can work anywhere. How hard would you think it would be to extend your DSL and support enough information to allow you to automatically build that API request? Yeah, absolutely, and and API and actually API validations, right. uh, so documentation and validation. We absolutely, we, we would love to do that. Ask, ask Brandon in the back. He's uh, my co-founder. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <what's that? laughs> you mentioned JSON and XML, which are more structured. What about not as structured, such as uh, URL form What are your thoughts on that? Um, the problem there is you can't do nesting, uh, or you can, like Rails does nesting. But I, I can't read that. Uh, um, uh, so if it's simple, I think that works just fine. Same thing with just like posting variables, right? Just like you know, submitting a form via the web. You can you can do a lot of the same things. Uh, but if the data needs more structure to be represented, that's what I'd say. 
So, so the question is, do the same rules apply for an internal API? Yeah. Did, did Netflix recommend that for their own internal systems? Or uh, <coughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah, I think I think I think it does change things. If you're doing it internally, you can basically set it up as like an expert API. And like two thirds of what I talked about there was about making it kind of seamless, easy to easy to learn, graceful, etc. Yeah, you can avoid worrying about some of those things. I'm sure some of the stuff uh, still is the same. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was going to say, I, I think what he mentioned about some of the protocols and that that you would do on an internal API where you know your infrastructure are appropriate, but I think the things that you've done in Zen Coder and the things you do to make your API easy are just as important internally because you're going to go through developers, you're going to go through people, additional teams are going to take on responsibilities to use those internal APIs, so you should not skimp on that side of it just because you're developing for your in-house resources. You pay them more than you do your customers. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, I had to take over with my card during your presentation. So let somebody else, I apologize if this was covered, but uh, I can do it again if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> authentication for APIs, um, opinions on that, is OAuth the way of the future or what? I didn't cover that. Uh, do you think go off this way in the future? No, no. Yeah. No, it's part of the future. Part of the future. It's not the whole future. Because you have a situation where you have two servers that you love. They just need to talk to each other. Not on behalf of anybody, but on behalf of themselves. So all off doesn't exist yet. Sure. Go off only applies to you. Yeah, to, to, to more third party uh, situations. I, I, I didn't talk in detail about different authentication uh, methods. Partly because I, I, I don't think I have a strong opinion on what the best one is, but if anyone does. There's no single one. That's why there's more than one. <coughs> I'm curious how you make sure that your documentation is up to date and correct. Yeah, how do we make sure documentation is up to date and correct? Uh, we don't do it perfectly, so I'm sure there's stuff in our documentation right now that's not. Uh, if we did have integrated you know, uh, uh, docs and request builder and, uh, and validation and all that, we'd be forced to. That'd be great. But oh, one thing I didn't talk about here too is uh, uh, something that we don't do. We um, we uh, uh, we don't white list value uh, uh, API settings coming in. Uh, we should, um, uh, and we will at some point. So we know we do. Uh, which means that if someone like misspells an API key, it just like silently fails. That's not ideal. Much better to tell them this is not a recognized API key. You do that by white listing what comes in and rejecting the request for things. So that would also help us like, keep our documentation more up to date if things fail more often because of that, that kind of thing. Specifically, have you considered using Cucumber or Prepper like that to generate all the tests we get the documentation? Um, yeah, uh, uh, not, not in detail, um, but uh, if you could do all those things put together, that would be really powerful. Yeah, in case you want another data point right back here in the, in the past. Yeah. There was somebody who gave a presentation on that, I forget where, but they're basically mapping their feature set into documentation. It was me. Is that a very good thing? Basically, using like Cucumber, like your, your, your specs for your app, to generate your documentation. So you know that your docs are in sync with your application. Really good designs. Say it again. Read me driven. Read me driven. Yeah, yeah, read me driven.